Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Brilliant Mind Studio. Please give a warm welcome to your host from the University of California in San Francisco, Professor Michael Cabana. Good morning. Welcome to the Brilliant Mind Studio. My name is Michael Cabana. I'm a professor of pediatrics, epidemiology, and biostatistics at the University of California in San Francisco. Today at the Brilliant Mind Studio, we'll be talking about lactobacillus ruteri, specifically DSM-17938, and its use in the treatment of colic, constipation, and functional abdominal pain. We'll also talk about new developments, as well as what we've learned in terms of evolution and how that might apply to populations today. With me today are my guests and good colleagues, uh, Professor Jens Walter from the University of Alberta in Canada, also Professor Wolfgang Kunze from McMaster University and St. Joseph's Healthcare, and Hania Shayuska uh, from the University of Warsaw, and Professor Flavia Indrio from the University of Bari. Uh, let's get started. Um, Jens, you've done a lot of work with evolution and you've published a lot of papers on this topic. I understand that lactobacillus ruteri is found in many animals. What does that tell us? So it, it, it does tell us really that this species is a, a core component of the you know, microbiome of, of, of many you know, mammals and, and even birds and that these, these host species you know, have conserved that species you know, as part of their, of their you know, microbiome over, over, um, you know, yeah, over their, over their evolution. And, and my group is interested, you know, why that happened and what is the ecology behind this. And we are doing uh, um, studies using, you know, population genetics and comparative and functional genomics. And we combine these uh, studies with experimental models in, in mice and, and also other animals, including humans. And what we found in these studies is interesting is not only that Lactobacillus reuteri is very dominant in, in some of these host species, but we also find that if you look at a, um, a phylogenetic tree, which is actually shown here, you can see, and this is a phylogenetic tree of around 115 Lactobacillus reuteri strains, um, you can see there is a clear clustering of these strains, and we have this color coded this by their actually host that they are coming, which what, what shows that this species actually evolves with these hosts and then basically aligns with their specific host and, and diversified in these host confined clustering, which tells us that the species is, is really, um, you know, associating itself with specific hosts over evolutionary timescales, which is for me a, a hallmark of, of symbiosis, meaning that the species, you know, and, and the host actually kind of co-evolves together um, um, to yeah, form a biological unit, and that, that then basically you know, forms the, the, the unit of selection during evolution. Yeah. So there's some adaptation, you'd say, and what's, what's the evidence of this adaptation towards this symbiosis that you mentioned? Yeah, and, and this is something we are studying extensively, so what we, what we do, and this is the nice thing with this experimental model, we can use like the, also these strains that we have here, and we can put them back into animals such as, such as mice and such as, such as chicken, and then look basically just who wins, and when we do these experiments, we actually see that rodent strains always win in mice, and we've just published, actually this week, we've just published similar experiments in chicken, and there we show that the chicken strains always win, meaning that this evolutionary process that I was describing is actually resulting in yeah, host speciality. And the, the probably clearest outcome is if you look at the mechanistic level, so what, what, we are, what I show here are biofilms of Lactobacillus reuteri strains on the four stomach of, of mice. So these are experiments in mice and the, and the bacterial cells here are actually stained in, in red. Mm -hmm. And what you can see here with rodent strains is that they form these nice dense biofilms while, and we've done this extensively, if you use strains from other hosts, you can see there's absolutely no adherence at all. So the host really has evolved, or probably the partnerships have evolved a very high level of fidelity, you know, to, to really select the right strain, and with this, um, you know, have a mechanism to, to keep these strains, you know, over probably millions of years. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in your tree that the human branch is, is quite small. Are, is this species, uh, there you go, is this yeah. species uh, 
present in all populations? So, so, so the human, the human uh, lineage is really a, a fascinating thing, and we, we are still just learning about this. It, it, you, so you're completely right. We have this human cluster here, which you can see is basically almost a particular strain that is actually in human, in, in human populations. And um, if we look into the genomes, we can actually see, yeah, they are very homogeneous. They have smaller genomes than the other strains, which actually points to a process of reductive evolution. And if we compare these genomes, we see there is virtually no difference, even if some strains are isolated in Peru, for example, or mm -hmm. in Germany. And that really points to a, a population bottleneck or a selective sweep. And we're not entirely sure what, what exactly happened, but it, it was really work published um, by Gerhard Reuter, um, who did extensive studies on the lactobacilli microbiota in, in, in humans, and he found lactobacillus reuteri all the time in, in, in populations in, in, in Germany, for example. While I'm, I work in this field, I really have a very hard time to find lactobacillus reuteri in Westerners. And to really follow up on this, we were you know, hypothesizing, you know, could it be that lactobacillus reuteri is present in, in also it, it speaks to a decline in the population of lactobacillus reuteri in, in, in Western countries. And to test this hypothesis, we actually put a lot of effort into getting fecal samples from um, rural tribes in Papua New Guinea um, and, and, and analyzed their microbiome. And if we looked into this, as a first we saw this, the microbiome of these, of these populations is actually very different. But then we also confirmed what many other studies showed if you compare westernized with non-industrialized microbiome. So these Papua New Guineans have a much, much richer microbiome, so they have more species. So for some reason, modern lifestyle actually depletes the microbiome, and this is very, very well established. And then when we looked into specifics, then in fact, one of the species that we detected in every single Papua New Guinean and in none of our USM controls was actually um, a, a species that had, or a sequence that had 100% homology with Lactobacillus reuteri. And, and this is actually the graph which you can see present in every single Papua New Guinean and non-detectable, at least with this method in any of the US controls, showing you know, that yes, something in modern lifestyle seems to deplete Lactobacillus reuteri. Mm -hmm. Well, many of our clinicians here this morning don't practice in Papua New Guinea, but in modern <laughs> environments, uh, what are the take-home messages for today's clinicians working with kids in modern environments? Yeah, so it's probably related to my motivation, you know, to see this as a biological system, you know, that, that evolved, you know. So I, I really do think that Lactobacillus reuteri has evolved, you know, with different hosts, and it has meant, been maintained by the host and domesticated, you know, for a, for a, for a reason, you know. And um, that really storm, uh, uh, it points to a stable long-term symbiotic relationship. So I really see this as a symbiosis in which a lineage of the gut, and we know that the microbiome is very important for health, so this is one of these you know, microbes that have specifically evolved to basically support their, their, the health of their, of their host. Yeah? And um, if, you, if you look at evolutionary theory, then these stable um, relationships actually often result in a mutualistic um, relationship and there is in fact actually quite a bit of very high profile research published in Nature Medicine in Cell recently and we will hear some more fascinating work about the benefits um, of Lactobacillus reuteri in this session but this, this body of evidence really points that this species um, is important you know, for the development of the host specifically in terms of its immune system but probably also the development of, of its, if its nervous system um, and, and this is really, and then considering you know, that this important species, which has all these beneficial roles in mice, has been basically you know, um, removed from, from the Western population, actually you know, provides for me a, a, a rationale to actually you know, put Lactobacillus reuteri into, into humans, and specifically kids, which is an important you know, window in the development of a human. So if I would have kids, I would probably try to add reuteri you know, into their gut too. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, uh, congratulations on your work and congratulations on the publication.